the Ashley Book of Knots, which my son just gave me for my birthday. Every single knot that you could ever tie in a piece of rope or string or thread, they're all here. You can see why I don't um, have parties up here. Flasks of water in case I get thirsty. This gigantic um, collection of every motif in every folk story in the entire world. Belief that an island may be towed by ships to new location. That's a good story. Absolute gem here. A treasury of every story you could possibly want. The Well, the process is going on all the time. <laughs> whether I'm in here or asleep or up for a walk or whatever, of course, because um, it's uh, much, of, much of what goes to make up a book goes on away from the book itself. But when I come up here, uh, which I do every day, um, every morning, I sit down at this table, which is crowded with things. Um, my Buddha, which Jude gave me for a Christmas present years ago, my books of poetry, which I can't be very far from, um, the notes I've been making for the current book, the laptop on which I'm having to write the current book. Anything else I can tell you about up here? Oh yes, this this is um, this is a piece from a dark matter detector, which the people at Cullum Laboratories gave to me. They invited me to go and see what they were doing. I found it absolutely fascinating, and this bit didn't work. It fogged over or something. When we moved here 20 years ago. Um, we had lived in a house where I worked in a garden shed. Well, it's a garden shed, it was a proper building, building but it was in the garden. garden. And uh, when we moved to this house, which is a bigger house, but which has less room for a shed in the garden, I immediately bagged this particular room. It's small, I don't need a lot of space, I just need to be able to reach the, you know, anything I want is within an arm's length away. Um, it's quietish, being at the top of the house. It's um, sunny when the sun is shining. It's got everything I want in it, really. What else have I got? Oh yes, my um, my procession of dignitaries. A procession of little opium weights. And incidentally, I can show you. This is a procession. Now, it's a story. There's a bookcase there, which contains lots of books of no particular importance, but what it's, at the moment there's a map. Um, because the book I'm writing, which doesn't yet have a title, it's the third part of the Book of Dust, involves long journeys uh, in a world which is not ours, but very like ours. The geography is more or less the same. So I've got um, uh, this map of the world and Lyra has moved from Oxford and she's now sort of in the Caspian Sea area, but she's moving a little further east, which she'll have to do in the next 60 pages. And um, I, can, I can see it all there, you see, and that, that, that's a great help, but I can't see it in detail. So I have to use my close-up binoculars, these wonderful things which you can use to look at insects and so on exactly the right focal length and distance for me to pick out the Black Sea, Azerbaijan, Turkmenistan, the Tian Shan Mountains, the, the, the deserts, the you know, all that I can see it in great clarity. What else can I show you? Well in the past I would use this pen on this sort of paper and um, I stopped doing it about three years ago when I stopped writing with a pen, that is, about three years ago after COVID, when I came out of COVID and long, with, with um, a lot of arthritis that I'd never had before. And what else have I got? My, my, my worry beads. I can't remember where these came from. Somebody gave me these. Again, I don't, they don't, they don't, um, they're just things to fiddle with. Like my barometer. Uh, my son gave me this, it's fascinating. I can see when the pressure's high and when the pressure's low, and um, it, I just like having it there. Really. I had great pleasure in doing those drawings, all of them. Um, it's the only drawing commission I've ever had, and I enjoyed it so much I almost thought of giving up words and taking to pictures. 
I grew up, it did most of my growing up and before, before the age of 12 anyway, traveling around the world on uh, ships because my father's, my father and my stepfather were both RAF officers posted to what remained of the British Empire. So I've, I've, I saw a lot of the world before I was 10. Um, but from 10, 11 onwards, we lived in North Wales. And I went to the local school, as I'd been to the local school in Australia and other places. Um, and the idea of going to university at all didn't really occur to me until, I suppose, the sixth form. What are you going to do next? Oh, I don't, don't, don't know, really. I like reading books. The obvious thing seemed to be to go to a university and study English. Um, I like the idea of Oxford. Never been here. None of my family had ever been here. Um, indeed, to university at all, I think. Anyway, I applied. I got a scholarship to Exeter College and came to Oxford as a very naive 18 year old in 1965. Was enormously impressed by everything all around me this beautiful city, these gorgeous buildings, the air of antiquity and splendour and learning and all that sort of stuff. Uh, and one of the places, of course, that you have to be introduced to is the Bodleian Library. So I went and got my Bodleian ticket and solemnly swore not to bring fire or flame into the building or whatever the wording is. I was far too terrified to go back for a long time. I used the Radcliffe camera because you could just walk in and find a book and sit and read. <laughs> um, but I didn't really start using the Bodleian properly until I was grown up and writing books. And then I thought, well, I've got a Bodleian ticket. I might as well use it. And enjoyed the whole process so much that when I came to writing his dark materials in about 1993, um, Again, my first resource was the Bodleian Library, uh, and I looked up books on early ballooning, on um, the Arctic, on everything I wanted to read. It's wonderful. You just go there, you look it up, you find it, you put it in your slip to order it, and then you go back and it's there and you can read it. Absolutely extraordinary. The seed of the book was really Paradise Lost. Um, and another way of telling that story. Um, but I set it in an Oxford which wasn't exactly our Oxford because it was it was easy. I, I knew Oxford and I knew our Oxford and I knew I could easily make up an Oxford that wasn't quite our Oxford. It had to be not quite our Oxford because I, I could see things happening later in the story that didn't or would be f uncomfortable to call realism. And I was uncomfortable about my, that myself to begin with because that's the sort of book I like. I like realistic stories. I don't much care for fantasy. I don't read it. I don't write it. I don't think what I write is fantasy. I call it realism, but others may have a different view. Uh, but it was it was quite easy to, to take the Oxford which exists and twist it a bit and extend it a bit and put a bit onto this college and dig a bit below that college and um, just fool around with it. Um, and I knew it and I could make it sort of convincing and um, I was very pleased and very happy to find that it seemed to work for a lot of people. I've lost count of the number of people who told me and I think meant it that they they came to Oxford because of his dark materials that's where they wanted to come and study. I don't plan my books in advance. I wanted Lara to go north to the Arctic that's all that's all I wanted. I didn't know what was going to happen there, but off she went to the north and I followed her and wrote down what I what I found was happening. But to plan it ahead of time, no, I, um, I can't, I can't imagine anyone doing that. Though people do. P.G. Woodhouse, for example, whose plots were impeccably constructed, um, wrote a detailed scenario, as I think he called it, for each novel and then, then wrote the novel. Well, I'd much rather wait to find out what happens. Because if I'm surprised, then the reader will be surprised. If I'm not surprised, maybe they won't. The ukuleles are mine. I was a guitarist for years and years. But when I was at school, Bob Dylan was the thing, and we were all, we were all Bob Dylan. Most of my books are written, in fact, I think all my books are written in the third person. That's to say, I am an observer of what's going on. I, I watch it, I see it, and I report. Now, who am I writing for? I don't know, and I don't care. It's, it's none of the reader's business, what I write, as I'm writing it. 
I, as I've often said, I am the, the sole tyrant. I am the dictator, the, um, the, the supreme emperor of everything that goes on. Um, but when the book is published, the relationship entirely changes and it becomes a democratic one. The book says this, the reader can think, well, what's that mean? Um, what do you think it means? Well, I think it means this. Well, in other words, the meaning emerges not from the book alone, but from the dialogue between the book and the reader. That's fine. That's the democratic process. That's what I like. And if I'm asked whether this is right or that is right, I say, well, what, what do you think? I mean, I can tell you what I think, but I'm only the, I'm only another reader at this point. I'm not the boss anymore. Um, so there's that. And then there's another question to do with who's telling the story or putting it in another way. Where do you put the camera? Where do you put the camera, as David Mamet pointed out, is one of the few questions, one of the most important questions the film director has to ask. Where do I put the camera? Where am I seeing this scene from? Is this a close-up? Is it a wide shot? Should I put the camera up there? It's a fundamental question and the same question applies with every scene you write. But I'm not a camera. I'm not filming it exactly from the outside. I'm also commenting on it slightly. I can say in many ways Lyra was a coarse and greedy little savage. Now, she wouldn't say that, a camera wouldn't say that, but the teller of the story can say that. The om omniscient or impersonal narrator, the voice that I like to tell stories in, is one of the greatest inventions of the human mind. My book, Clockwork, or All Wound Up, which is a sort of fairy story, it's a, sh it's a short little book. Um, I'm very fond of that because I think it's the most perfectly shaped of all my books, of all my stories. Um, I like the atmosphere in the story. I like the neatness with which it all works. I wouldn't mind if on my tombstone it said, this is where Philip Pullman, author of Clockwork, or All Wound Up, wound up. <laughs>